This week on Feel Good Friday, the dark and twisted history of transplantation, drinking dino piss, AI lifeguards, and virgin croc births. Did you say virgin? There were so many things I said in there where I was like, <laughs> where I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Did you say virgin croc births? I said virgin croc birth like crocodile i guess we'll have to see it's the last thing we talk about today but uh one thing i will say we're gonna bump we're gonna bump what the health to the very top because today in what the health i want to go through this fucking the history of this one particular doctor kind of the history of like organ transplantation in general, but I have to say right off the top, I have, I, I have to give a little bit of a, um, trigger warning, content warning before we go into this. There is some stuff in this that is kind of a bummer. Um, bummer warning, a bummer, big, big time bummer warning, especially for those who are dog lovers, which all three of us are. Oh, there's some, there's, some, no. there's, some bummer, there's some bummer warnings, but we... it is far too fucking fascinating not to dive into. So I want to tell you guys the story. I'm already sad of Dr. Vladimir Demikov. Now, forget what I just told you. OK, just forget the dog thing. OK, Vladimir <laughs> Demikov. So this guy, Vladimir um, Petrovich Demikov, I could be pronouncing the last name wrong, but I think it's Demikov. Uh, he's from Russia. He was from Russia. He was born July 31st, 1916. Um, and he died in November of uh, 1998. Okay. So he lived a, a pretty, pretty, long pretty good life. run. Yeah. He, was a, he was a Soviet scientist and an organ transplantation pioneer um, who performed several transplants in the 40s and 50s, including the transplantation of a heart into an animal and a heart lung replacement in an animal. Okay. So wow. we'll, we'll kind of, we'll get there, but a uh, uh, little bit of history of this guy, right? So Vladimir, I have some photos. I'll bring them up when we get to the end. Um, he was born in 1916 to a Russian family of peasants. I love that. This is, this is Wikipedia. <laughs> what, that's, what constitutes as a peasant? A peasant is a, a peasant is like a term used when there was like a, when there was a super structured class system where like in, in societies where, you could not move into and out of classes. Like whatever you were born into, that's where you were. And so peasant was like an like like uh, you know like a like a common folk. You know you couldn't hold. I don't know. You, I mean, we're fucking going back and using old language, but like you couldn't hold station or status of like any kind. Like you couldn't be. You weren't. You weren't a noble or you weren't actually, an aristocrat. It, you know, it's interesting. It's very specific to farming. So a peasant is a pre-industrial. Okay agricultural laborer or a farmer with limited land ownership, especially one living in the middle ages under feudalism and paying rent that's, taxes. That's right. And, and, and to ground this in, in something that's current and relevant, they would have been on the bottom floor of the Titanic. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. So, uh, so Demikov family peasants, uh, living on a small, small farmstead in the Northern part of Russia's, uh, uh, Volgograd region. His father was killed during the Russian, Russian Civil War when uh, Demikov was about three. So he never really knew his dad. And so his brother and his sister were raised by their mother who somehow managed to provide them with a really great education. And so he began to show interest in the mam uh, mam mammalian circulatory system as a teenager. And this was inspired by Pavlov's experimental work with dogs. That's a really polite way to say that he was one of those weird fucking kids who's dude. cutting open fucking animals in his backyard. So, so like here, the neighbor's cat. <laughs> yeah. dude. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. The, I mean, the circulatory system. Yeah. We showed an interest in the insides of animals at a young age. I, like, honest, I honestly think this guy had two, two paths in his life. He, he, would, he had two paths to choose. One would have been very like Jeffrey Dahmer esque, totally, yeah. and the other is like one of the most important scientific, like humans in the world of 
transplantation. So what you're saying is Jeffrey Dahmer could have been. Uh, he definitely could have. Yeah. Could have been. If one he of the most if, if he just had a you know no, was, important figures in of the last in a different years. way. I am saying in a way that you know he, what? yes, I am yeah. saying that, and I think it was his dad's fault. You know, it is daddy issues. Things like he lost his dad when he was three. That's Brian, that's trauma. We know severely tra- traumatic. Cool. Jeffrey Dahmer, take us to Jeffrey's school. dad was. A long for the ride. I'm, I'm talking about Demikov. Yeah. So, like, he lost his dad at a young age. You know, he became one of those kids who isolated and, you know, like cut open squirrels in his backyard. Mm-hmm. And then could have, as you said, became a serial killer, but instead pursued a weird sort of version of that that left some sort of valuable legacy for society. I do wonder, like, as a teenager, if you start to show interest in the circulatory system of mammals. <laughs> are you reading books or are you just kind of experiment, just kind of scoping it out for yourself? <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so again, he was also really inspired by Pavlov's um, experimental work with dogs. I bet. So when he left school Ding. in 1931, his first job was at the Stalingrad tractor plant where he worked as a mechanic and repairman. Okay. So access to a lot of tools makes sense in 1934. So just a few years later, he began studying at the Voronezh State University, where in 1937, so just three years later, he created the world's first artificial heart and successfully implanted it into a dog, which survived for two hours after the surgery. So the very first artificial heart, he made it, and then he implanted it into a dog, and it Worked for a very short period of time, but it worked. We're, so we're assuming that like artificial, because the world's first artificial heart sound like the, the first thought I had was like, oh, this really like comprehensive, like a, a amazing. Um, oh, you yeah, two pairs of socks on. I was like, that's what you're <laughs> I was like, are you, right I was like, are you wearing sockets over your socks? <laughs> um, the, so like the first thing. Great. Just keep it. Just keep the energy flowing. <laughs> we're on this track and Taylor's over here. Like and also. But you and I got diagnosed with ADHD. Taylor's over here. We're tell- I'm telling the story and Taylor's going, This is huh, classic Taylor. Two socks? <laughs> oh, no. Just one I sock. check right now. <laughs> How uh, fucking bored can you get? <laughs> God damn it. Uh, man, you, we need like a course in how to podcast that we can send Taylor to. Uh, in eight years. <laughs> the, so I imagined at first like a really complex heart. But what I'm imagining now is that it was actually probably more like just just a pump. Just yeah, just I mean, it was it was a shitty plunger, is what it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a description of this particular groundbreaking work was published uh, a year later in 1938 in the university's student newspaper, and it was presented to the other students as a, uh, at a scientific conference following the, in the following month. He then transferred to the biology fact, faculty of Moscow State University, where he wrote his first scientific work, and graduated with honors in August of 1940. Okay, so he graduates in 1940, but then right after graduation, he's conscripted into the military and has to go serve um, as a soldier. Um, and he goes to World War, uh, World War II, and he serves on the front line as a forensic expert and pathologist and spent time serving in China when the Soviets declared war on Japan in 1945. Maybe this is a little bit dark, but do you think that he was like really excited to be on the front lines, like just digging through human bodies? Because like, I mean, <coughs> like, like up until this point, he probably, you know, he's been doing most of his time focusing on animals, but then now he's getting a chance to like get in there and sort of do some forensics. Here's the thing. Like Here's the thing. Beings. I think, I think you, I think I, sh- I think I did you guys a disservice. By setting this up at the top saying there's some like dog trigger warning stuff because you really are leaning into this like he's a fucking serial killer. (laughs) Dude, this guy actually is like is is hailed as one of the most important scientific figures when it comes to surgery, when it comes to transplant. I mean, if it wasn't for this guy, lung transplant might not be a thing right now. If there's heart think, transplant might but, not be a thing but, right now. But if so like, I don't think he was actually a psychotic fucking... But if there's one thing I learned from my mess? therapist, it's that you can be two things at once. Right, I think you know, Jared's just trying to tell us the history of this guy. Yeah, yeah. That sure. is it. That is it. Yeah, that really is it. So so after the war, so he... Uh, so, or right, he went, he went to the war and he 
He found a bunch of dead Japanese men and he like took their penises and sewed them onto their foreheads <laughs> just just to see if it would, you know, if they would still work those penises. I told you. Um, <laughs> I told you. But anyway, weird. that's that's actually that, that's neither here nor there. After the war, Demikov resumed his post um, his his post in the human physiology department in Moscow. Where he continued his experimental research, eventually performing a successful heart and lung transplant on warm blooded animals. And in 1947. He moved to the Institute of Surgery in Moscow, where he began exp uh, to experiment with liver and kidney transplantation in the late 1940s. Now, he spent the 1950s carrying out research into organ transplantation surgery, continuously improving his experimental techniques. He successfully performed an isolated ortho, uh, orthotropic heart transplantation in a dog in 1951, where the heart was correctly positioned rather than offset inside the thoracic cavity. And the survival rates steadily increased from a few hours, like that original one, to several weeks. And then one of the dogs received a heart transplant in 1953, and it survived for another seven years. Wow. Which in dog years... That's a lot. There's a calculator out there. Well, let's see. 49 years. How many years is seven years in dog years? Years. Uh... A seven-year-old dog would be roughly 61, 62.1 human years old. So that's a, that's, that's pretty, that's a pretty successful um, heart surgery on a dog, I would say. I actually learned this the Very other day, successful. guys. Um, do you know what a, a, a lap day is for your pet? A lap a day? A lap day? Lap day. Do you know what that is? Like a day of rest where they should just chill in your lap? No. No, lap day is when your dog's age passes your age um, in relative years. So right. I learned this the other day on for me. and I, I set um, Rupert's lap day in my calendar because how'd you calculate it? There's a calculator on the, you can go to like dog lap day dot cool. dot com or something <laughs> cool. and yeah, there's a calculator. Right. Um, All right. So we're, it's, we're that's so cute. We're getting through this. There's a little bit more. Um, and then it starts to get really, really fascinating. So, um, so another seven years, the dog lived uh, a successful mammary coronary artery anastomos anastomosis was achieved in 1953. Now, do you guys know what that is? I do not. Me neither. And after unsuccessful attempts the previous year, he made it happen, whatever that is. Um, he also developed the principles of myocardial revascularization which enabled him to perform the first experimental cardio, uh, uh, coronary artery bypass operation. And the ultimate aim of his research was for organ transplantations to be implement, implemented into the clinical practice on humans. So he never really did any on humans. He was doing this on animals so that one day we could do it to humans. Right. Um, Anastomosis is a connection or opening between two things that are normally diverging or branching. Yeah, okay, sweet. So... Um, he was like very highly admired in the scientific community. Um, and one particular admirer of his work was a South African cardiac surgeon named Christian Bernard, who became convinced through studying Demikov's experiments that human heart transplantation, transplantation was a real possibility. And Bernard twice visited Demikov's laboratory in Moscow, once in 1960 and once in 63. And inspired by his observations there, he successfully performed the world's first heart transplant operation from one person to another in 1967. So this guy, the guy who did the first heart transplant basically was like credited Demikov as the person that made this all possible. And right. he called him, quote, the father of heart and lung transplantation, huh. Demikov. So here's a list of the firsts that this guy has achieved. In 1937, the first cardiac assist device artificial heart 1946 first intrathoracic heterotropic heart transplant into a chest cavity 1946 first heart lung transplant this is all on animals by the way 1947 first lung transplant 1948 first liver transplant 1951 first orthotropic correctly positioned heart transplant 1952 first mammary coronary anastomosis 1953, first successful experimental coronary artery bypass operation. And then in 1954, first head transplant. <laughs> no. Okay. No. 
All of the surgical procedures listed above were carried out on warm-blooded animals, non-human. Between 1963 and 1965, he also assembled the world's first collection of living human organs for surgical use. But this, all of this, is not why Vladimir Demikov is famous. He is most known for his life sentence that he got oh, man. <laughs> for all the bodies. So here, here's where the trigger warning comes in. So encouraged by his successes, Demikov began moving to Boulder experiments. And in 1954, he performed his most controversial experiment operation. A transplant. Where he grafted the, I mean, sort of, not really. Tried. He grafted the head and four legs of a small puppy to the neck of a large adult dog. He made a two-headed dog. No. He transplanted a dog's head onto another dog using vascular connections to the, ho- the host dog's heart. I almost read that as hot dog's heart. Ignoring the, <laughs> ignoring the condom, uh, the the condemnation the from condiments his, from his critics. Ignoring the, the hot dog, ig- ignoring the ketchup and the mustard, uh, ignoring the the condemnation from his critics. He continued with this particular line of exp- experimentation, becoming more successful with time. With one hybrid dog surviving for a month. Quote. This is a quote from Time Magazine. When the multiple, okay, so you know what? Before I read the quote, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some images. So here we go. Of the, of the dogs. No. Yes. This is. Oh no. Is that not one of the wildest things you've ever seen? Also, why does it look so recent? It does. Uh, I I think that I think this was um, color fight. Like like they they call like. Yeah. You can use technology to like recolor black and white images. Yeah. So there's more. Hold on. Both of the both of the heads are doing something. Oh. Oh, both of the dogs, when they came to after the surgery, were... I'll read you a quote in a second here, but here's another one. Oh, this is a different... So no. you get a little puppy with the, like, oh over top of the head. And God. so for people that, aren't, are, that, that have no interest in seeing this, which I, I don't blame you, but also it is pretty fascinating. If you're just listening, you've got like a German shepherd. So, you know, like a full-size dog. And then you've got like kind of a puppy, like a small like, like donut that's basically surgically attached on like, on like the, the nape of the German shepherd's like shoulders, like on the nape of his neck. Um, this is, this is them like before they woke up. Oh, it's kind of cute. It is. is that, I that, mean, that one is kind of cute. It's, Guys. it's, it is. It's so fucked up, but it's also, I mean, like, if you see two dogs snuggling like that, you're like, Oh, okay. the photo looks cute because it looks like yeah. the, the tiny dog is just resting peacefully yeah. on the, the big dog's head. You can't tell that they're attached. When you know they're attached, it's fucked up. And then Whoa, this one here, you dude. can kind of see like they have a little diagram Whoa. and the dog's like drinking. The other dog's just bored. I told you guys this guy was weird. Whoa. Now, here's a quote from Time Magazine when they covered this, when it sort of like hit the news back in the 50s. That is fucking crazy. When, when, why? Why? <laughs> well, there, so well, the, again, the reason was... why is, is, is simply because... He's testing how to connect arterial valves in ways that we hadn't done before. I mean, this isn't, this is, it really isn't. It isn't some sort of like, I'm just going to do this because it's fucking cool or it's weird or I'm like jerking off on the sides doing it. No, I know, he's I know. doing it with, he's doing it with like legitimate scientific, like l- legit scientific sort of um, goals in mind to push the push the the field of transplantation forward but obviously there's some like massive fucking ethical issues that come with the work that he's doing i mean he's like sort of proving at least the like beginnings of a hypothesis that you could transplant a human head onto like yes. another body yeah um and he's like, he's like i mean yeah no but like, like but it's I, could, I find it hard to to understand why you would have to put two heads on the same Dog. I think it's more, I think, it, I think it's less about like, it's le- I mean, I'm sure there's elements of it that are like, it's, we got to show that we can like do head transplants or whatever, but I, I think it's more so of the inner working. So it's like, can we, can we properly connect the like vascular system of one dog's head onto another dog's body to ensure that that dog we've added to this other dog has a working brain and like can function and like has its has you know so like here just listen to this 
they, Time Magazine said, when the multiple dog re, when the multiple dog, just, when the multiple dog regained consciousness after the operation, the puppy's head woke up and yawned, and the big head, the big head, gave the puppy a puzzled look and tried to shake it off at first. The puppy's head kept its own personality. Uh, though handicapped by having almost no body of its own, it was as playful as any other puppy. It growled and snarled with mock for, uh, um, fierceness or licked the hand that caressed it. The host dog was bored by all of this, but soon became reconciled to the un unaccountable puppy uh, that had sprouted out of its neck. When it got thirsty, the puppy got thirsty and lapped milk eagerly. When the laboratory grew hot, both, dog, both, both host dog and puppy put out their tongues and panted to cool off. After six days of life together, both heads and the common body died. And that was the first like, iteration of that. Whoa. Eventually it went on and he did it a number of times to a point where it lasted for 29 days. So his transplantation work was widely reported inside the Soviet Union, where it was continuously criticized for being unethical. But it was not until the late 1950s that news of ex his experiments spread to the outside world. And in fact, by the time the American surgeons became aware of Demikov's dog head transplantations, it was 1959, and he had already been performing these procedures for five years. But the fucking crazy part of all of that is that he's still looked at as like one of the most forward thinking and like valuable pieces to the puzzle of human transplantation when it comes to heart, lung, liver, like, like key vital organs that are saving people's lives every fucking day. Yeah. Yet there's this other, like, just oh, like, I mean, there's oh. probably no shortage of, I mean, especially pre, um, not pre scientific method, but like, cause that's quite old, but, um, pre I don't know pre like modern science like in the last like 30 ish years where yeah. where science is more global and like when you publish a study like it ends up in a journal and like everybody in the world can see it I guess yeah. like post internet really I guess um, that there's probably no shortage of examples of people that had success in one thing and then just just like kept yeah. pushing the boundaries and kept pushing the boundaries and are you know notable for notable and like applauded for one thing and then also like condemned yeah. for for like the lengths to which they went which you know they crossed the line at some point in the pursuit of tr trying to push the boundaries. yeah and i mean like during world war ii and after like soon after world war ii there was a bunch of really fucking gnarly shit going on in the scientific world scientific totally. like yeah there was that guy there was really that the guy discovery of like ato the like atomic energy and like yeah that whole yeah explosion there was that there was that guy in japan <laughs> no that um that got like, he got like dosed with this massive swath of radiation in a, in some sort of um, nuclear power plant accident. And they were like, Ooh, he's definitely dead, but he's technically still alive. So we'll drag out oh, as his right, length yeah. of life as yeah, long yeah. as we possibly can. And it was basically story. just like torture, right? And yeah. it's like, holy fuck. The, the thing that they I want find, to understand. They, want to understand. they go, we want to know, all right, what, ha like, yeah, what, what does radiation do? What does yeah. radiation mean to our bodies? You know? The thing that I find hard, hard to yeah. grapple with is, is the two heads on the dog. Like, if it was, and I understand what you're saying, but like, you know, maybe it's about understanding. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is, it's, although, although like, although, you know, someone like Tara Bork can go out there and get a lung transplant and like, thank God she can have that and, and survive and thrive. Man, those dogs didn't survive, didn't thrive. But even and if it was, even if it was a horrible thing, a single, like a single head for a, dog. for a single head, you know? And like it, the fact that like two heads on, on one dog just doesn't, it's really hard for my brain to compute because you know, there's not really like the possibility of those two dogs living a healthy life after that. Yeah. And but I you're know applying that to dogs and like we do that shit. Like we, we do far more horrific. We do far more horrific stuff than that. Currently. To animals. <laughs> just for, just in for, name, in the name of science. Just for your deodorant. I, I understand you know, that. It, or just I, for your perfume. Not, not that sort of stuff. But like I understand like the, you know, I, again, like if it was 
we're going to test a head transplant because this is something necessary for human survival in the future, or it's going to have some a mass, massive scientific benefit. And it was like a dog's head for a dog's head or a rat's head for a rat's head or whatever it was that they had to test it to, for it to make sense for human, for it to work on a human subject. Then I could understand that, but it seems so, you know, um, trivial to like attach another dog's head to yeah. another dog. But I think that's just because you're not really super tuned into like what his ultimate goals were. Right. Because I, like I we, agree. Cause, cause like, I, I totally agree. Maybe there was something where he was like, I have to understand how this thing works and that's going to benefit you like, know, th- transplants in another way. Think about like cancer treatments and like before chemo, maybe like before chemo, or when we were like discovering how chemo could, I'm, and I'm totally making this up. This I'm, I'm assuming that something like this happened where like we didn't have chemotherapy treatments and in order to find those treatments we were we we started get, we started giving animals cancer to try and to test them cuz mm-hmm. we do that and I know we do that now we give animals cancer and then we test things on them to see if they it will treat the cancer like that's so bad yeah <laughs> you know but we do it but like every but, day but so like, my i no, guess probably hundreds I guess of thousands helps, of times every this day this helps um clarify my point is that like i understand how bad that is if the animal gets a successful treatment in that case and the cancer is cured or treated, then the animal has a chance at living a normal life. No, it doesn't. They kill them. But like, but in, in the idea of like it being successful, it's, it's, it's a better outcome and they kill them now. They kill them now in, you know, 2023. They didn't like, they probably didn't kill them in 1960. If that was the case, they'd probably keep them and say like, Hey, this was successful. But with the dogs, this is successful. Putting, let's um, putting a well, second let's just drop head off on, in the alley. But I'm just saying, putting a second head <laughs> on a dog is like at the end of the day. To me, it's like, well, even if it works and it's super successful, and you make make your point, you learn your thing. It's like that you just fucking root, like killed those animals, basically. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I I don't disagree with you. I do have a question though. If there was like, if SBCA was just like, hey, like, we're, like I went into, I went into the pet store the other day uh, to to buy um, a bone for donut, and they had an SPCA like, uh, uh, like little cage for with a few cats that like you can go in and you can go, I'm gonna adopt these cats, um, and they were so fucking cute, these like little kittens, and they were fighting each other, it was so cute. But if you went into the pet store and then they were like, we got a SPCA cage like for adoption, these are these are some like lab tested animals, and this is a two headed dog, um. And we just need a home for this like two headed dog boy. Would you be like, is he good? Is he good? like, and, 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 and you found out like he's good. His health is good. <laughs> or sorry, their health is good. You just got to feed them both. And like, you know, the top dog might need like, and not the top dog as in like the alpha, but like the, the, the dog on the top <laughs> might need like a little extra help, like getting his food and stuff. Would you be like, I'm taking that dog in. I'm going to, no. you wouldn't. No, I wouldn't take that dog in. Oh my God. What a fucking dick! No, you because take... I didn't put that dog in that situation. There's I know, but the dog dogs... needs someone to take Dude, care of it. There are, come on, billions of dogs on this planet that need homes. <laughs> At least Whoa. millions, maybe billions of dogs on this planet that maybe need millions. homes right now. Probably we tried millions. to rehome every millions. dog, millions, and felt. Guilty if I about saw that. a two-headed dog that needed an, an, an adoption, I'd be I'd be taking that dog immediately. Just like I'd be taking the dog that had the tail coming out of his fucking forehead, guys. I got to tell you, I think, I think, I think, not so much you, but more both of you, but more so Brian. I think, our, I think your judgment is very clouded by the fact that it's a dog. I think it's just the kind of animal. I don't think so. What do you mean by judge? What do you, What do you think? I think it was a rat. I, would I mean, feel I just the think that like the, the like the like the way that we look at, and I get it. I don't. I'm not like judging you for it. I mean, I get it. We like we treat dogs differently. If it was a rat, we treat dogs different. We try, the we treat dogs thing? differently. Yeah, yeah. Just about, but about everything. Like, I just don't. I don't even know if we'd end up down this trajectory if we were talking about a different kind of animal. If we were talking about, um, you know, like a like a pheasant, or a, a pheasant, a uh, ferret, a, a ferret, like well, like a like a like a or very, a pheasant, <laughs> like a very common. I mean, birds like aren't a, really animals. like a very common. <laughs> yeah, they're dinosaurs. Yeah, uh, like a very common lab lab birds are a much real. more what common lab tested animal. A rat? Yeah, I don't think I think I think if it, I think if we were talking about two heads on rats, we'd just go whoa crazy. Like, 
Well, do, that's wild. I, I do. But when I, we talk about dogs, we, we I, because I do we agree have with this you. I do agree with you that if it, if this was rats, I go, isn't that fucking crazy? But then dogs, I'm like, rat. oh god, that sucks. Um, it's because we 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 obviously have yeah, a we've extreme got a, extreme yeah. attachment to yeah. dogs as you know now, more, more than really any other animal. Probably. Now we we covered this a while ago, but Doctor Canabero, I believe an Italian doctor, a little kooky, looks like a villain from a Marvel movie. He was the guy that was like, I'm going to do the world's first like successful human head transplant. Excuse me. Um, do you guys remember that guy? Yeah. And there was a the guy that I like, remember had, the head transplant. Was, I thought the, he was Russian. No, the Russian dude was the guy that signed up to be his, oh, okay. his patient. Um, Dr. Canavero, his work is very much tied directly to the history of, no doubt. of Vladimir's. Uh, work. I'm not saying that all of these guys could be or are serial killers, but like there's some sort of like if there was like a Venn diagram of these type like types of humans. There's a bit of crossover. There would be some sort yeah, of overlap. Little overlap. There. Like they would sit in this like yeah. gray area of yeah. like a little bit of weirdness. God, more so than like you know a cartoonist <laughs> for the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. like like statistically yeah. probably more so than. Yeah, 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 or like, or like a janitor or something. I love a good Venn diagram. <laughs> Speaking of janitors, um, this, uh, this, I didn't even have this prepped. Um, uh, let's see. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep. The I gotta, I gotta Google it. Um, there was a. Did you guys hear about the janitor that made a big old fucking whoopsie? <laughs> Ooh, what kind of whoopsie? Uh, multi-million dollar whoopsie. How do you do that? You hear about that? Uh, let's uh, let's see the if the gems are at NASA. Um, have we verified the authenticity of this story? This is pretty uh, authentic. Uh, I feel like I mean, everything we've been covering lately <laughs> ends up being yeah. and, and now this this is one not our fault. This is one. Um, so there was a uh, there was this guy. Why doesn't anything? Okay, here we go. So um, nope, this is not it. Uh, oh well, well that's too bad. What do you remember of it? Uh, so there was a janitor who was working at a scientific lab and there was this, uh, this like annoying beeping sound. Um, <laughs> and it was like level four and, bio lab but, breach basically. And so he, he was like, he was like, Oh fuck that fucking noise. So he goes and he switches it off. Here we go. Annoyed janitor turns off super cold freezer and destroys decades of scientific work no. causing at least a million da- dollars in damages. I mean, uh, the scientific, the law scientific work is the, is the real decade, decades. Worth. I mean, a freezer that's supposed to be cold for decodes shouldn't make an annoying beep. It's yeah. It, it's super cold too. I think it probably so, made an annoying beep because it was trying to say that it needed help. Yeah. It was yeah. probably a cry for help. It definitely needed help when he turned it off. A janitor working at a laboratory was annoyed by an incessant beep, uh, reportedly flipped a switch that killed the noise, but also shut off a storage freezer, uh, destroying decades of scientific work. According to the, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute lab in Troy, New York. Uh, the cleaner's alleged carelessness awesome, cost RPI. the lab at least one million U.S. dollars in damages. A lawsuit the university filed against its third-party cleaning service charged. Uh, people, people's behavior and negligence caused all of this. Michael Ginsburg, RPI lawyer, told the Times Union in Albany. Unfortunately, he lost his job. Unfortunately, they wiped out twenty-five years of research. 25 years of research down the drain because the guy was like, eh, fucking noise. But I get it. If, it's, if that noise was anything like you shaking that bottle last week, I get it. <laughs> That's a tough sound. To, to Do you guys, um, did you guys bury any time capsules when you were kids? I think I did. I school. did, and I have no idea where or what, when they were supposed to be opened. Or right? What no the idea. fucking deal Isn't is. Isn't that sad? someone going to text me? Am I going to get an email? You How should, many right? time capsules do you think are just like three feet underground from f- bunch long of, past their bunch duty. of eight-year-olds. I'd, I'd say the majority of them. Yeah. Because, like, who after a certain amount of time... You know what I bet they do? Who remembers? I bet you, you make it at school when you're, like, seven, eight years old. You and, then they time, ta- and then they, they take time, that time capsule to the farm. Make your time capsule, yeah. <laughs> that's right. And then, and then June 30th rolls around. Everybody goes home for a summer break. And then on July 2nd, yeah. they just take a little trip out to the school field. They just dig, they, they dig a foot underground and they just take all the time capsules and then they burn them. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. Or they bury them in the garbage yeah. in a landfill somewhere. Actually, you know what? First, because I know that I'm 
I'm pretty sure I, I have an inside knowledge from the teachers union. They actually open up all the time capsules and just to check them for money or valuables. And they take them. That's good, actually. They take good all the idea. valuable stuff. How's that water tasting, too? Tastes good. Super, Ew. super plain. <laughs> ah, it tastes like tastes like water. Yeah. Now, tastes like water should taste like nothing. Right. Now, what if I told you? Oh no. What is you that that water actually probably does have a taste that we just don't even. We don't even know because it's all we've ever known. Is that the taste of it, though? Is the taste nothing? Well, I don't know. Is I know it's it hard to say. Nothing? I mean, th- this is kind of like the old, this is kind of like the old uh, adage of, uh, <laughs> is it squirt or is it pee? I don't know. <laughs> is that um, an adage? That's an, that's an old adage. It goes back years. Uh, do we really know? Do we know what, do we know what squirt is? Well, is it cum? Is it pee? It's interesting because I think, I think with water, um, well, here, but here's my point. I know mm. something about water that you guys don't know. Oh yeah. So do I. Okay. You, you go first. Okay. Um, all water that exists on this planet. Ah, has- stop. <laughs> the average American drinks four cups of water every day. According to the U S department of agriculture, that is far short of the recommended eight glasses of water every day and equivalent around four cups of dinosaur pee. Yes, that's what you I was were drinking. Say. Dinosaur, you. I just made him drink dinosaur piss. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> Thank you God, did. you bitch <laughs> got you. Wait, hold Dude, on. This motherfucker just drank dinosaur piss. <laughs> so this is Sprite, motherfucker. I don't drink dinosaur pee. <laughs> Dude, I'm so confused. Sorry. All of it. All of it. We are all, all drinking water. dino pee. All water's been peed up by a dinosaur. And so my whole point to that was maybe dinosaur pee tastes like. Squirt. All water's been peed up by a dinosaur. Every what? molecule of water right, on this planet here, has been peed up by a dinosaur. <laughs> Do you mean because at one point it was fro? It, wait, what? I mean, at one point it was dinosaur pee. At one point, a dinosaur drank it and then pissed it out. Yes. So whether it's tap, filtered, bottled, sparkling, or sourced from your, uh, uh, no, sorry, sourced from the Himalayan glaciers and uh, sparkled with gold dust, you are just actually drinking the liquid waste of an ancient beast, says scientific-centric YouTube channel Curious Minds. A video explaining this theory says <laughs> that a very small percentage of all the water in the so world skeptical of this. is available for drinking purposes, but it is still a huge amount of water to provide for the needs of every human being that has ever walked on the surface of the earth for the last 200,000 years. Every year, around 121,000 cubic miles of water, or uh, about the equivalent of 42 superior lakes, falls down on earth and constantly flows through the rivers, lakes, ground reservoirs, and everywhere else it passes through, including insides of the guts of the people and the animals to drink it. That's the water cycle. what do dinosaurs have to do with all this? Well, unlike humans who have been on Earth for a tiny fraction of the 186 million years that dinosaurs ruled this planet, the beasts were here far longer than we have ever been. In that long span of time, it is very likely that the dinosaurs have drunk all the water available to them and all the water available now is simply water that has passed through a dinosaur's kidneys, making its way through the never ending water cycle. Why do you find that so hard to believe? Humans (laughs) are drinking dinosaur squirt. So the reason that I find it hard to believe is because, is because the pro so, so by, uh, by in contrast to this, there is a, um, there is a uh, <laughs> there is a similar there is a similar um, statistic or I guess fact out there that is that <laughs> fact <laughs> that is that that um, like the air that you're breathing has been. Like it's just a, like it's a, all like farts. A fraction, it's all poop. No, that a fraction of that, farts. basically a fra, a, a, you know, a very f- <laughs> small, maybe infinitesimal, infinitesimally small fraction of every breath that you take has been, has been, also breathed in and out by, um, like you know, like any the any pope. like major historical figure you can you can name, because there's a mo- because there's a certain molecule, uh. Uh, I can't remember exactly which one it is. Um, that uh, does not undergo any chemical change when you breathe in and breathe out. 
you know, like you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out CO2, but there's a molecule within the oxygen that doesn't, that doesn't, um, that doesn't change, undergo a process. So like those molecules are left unchanged in the atmosphere. And so like, you know, like you're like a tiny fraction of every breath that you've taken is breathed by Einstein, for example. So like, it's like, you've got all these amazing people inside you. It's something that Neil deGrasse Tyson goes on a lot about. Um, and that makes sense because it's like, it's in the air and it's kind of, it's like free floating around. That makes way less sense to me because they're on the planet for such a short amount of time. So like, like, could you breathe in and out all of the oxygen on the planet in your lifetime? I don't know I, how many years would it take I, to do I, that. And I think, I think that's because there's, there's so many people constantly breathing in like at a constant rate. So the re, and the reason that it's hard for me to, to wrap my head around this is because uh, the, the process is so much more complicated in terms of like drinking water and then like getting it out and then it evaporating. And like, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's boggling my mind. I'm not saying I disagree with that. So I'm just saying I, it's, it's like, it's, it's a gigantic piece I of think, I think Taylor's process. just embarrassed at the idea of drinking pee. And so, <laughs> uh, so he's so like, too, I, yeah. I didn't, I, just, I didn't drink that. I don't believe it. I didn't drink dyes with pee. <laughs> not me. <laughs> you, you might drink dyes with pee. It's, I it's like the, the not elementary, the, the elementary water cycle. Um, where yeah yeah I understand the water the condens- <laughs> I know so the water it, there's condensation and then precipitation and then pee and then evaporation and uh, then the the, uh, the YouTube channel uh, they go on to say quote humans guess, consume yeah. a lot of water but our species hasn't had the number of time the the numbers or time to process a large portion of of Earth's water dinosaurs on the other hand had a long time to drink water uh, the uh, Mesozoic era. The, reg- uh, the reign of the dinosaurs lasted for 186 million years. That gave them time to drink a lot of water. So while most molecules in your 8-ounce glass have never been drunk by any other human, almost every single molecule has been drunk by a dinosaur and come out of the dinosaur as pee and or squirt because of the, both the same thing. Um, Charles Fisherman, uh, Fisherman, author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water, says water molecules are extremely resilient. And it's likely that all water molecules present now were the same water molecules available for billions of years. All of the water on Earth has been through a dinosaur kidney. Fisherman tells Marketplace.org, every bottle of Evian you drink is from a Tyrannosaurus Rex's giant penis. (laughs) All the water on Earth has been here for 4.5 billion years. It's all toilet to tap at some level. So... How's that dinosaur pee taste, eh? Huh? Pretty uh, <laughs> fucking loser. Pretty clear. <laughs> um, less um, less, am- less ammonia like that. I thought it would. Um, I thought that was uh, really neat. That was awesome. Regardless of how real it is, uh, let's move on to a little, a uh, little bit of. Hey, Bri. Hey, Bri. I don't know how I feel about this. How would you guys feel about an AI lifeguard? Uh, does it save your life if you need it to? Well, located in Weisbaden, Klein Fletchen, swimming baths. <laughs> this facility boasts both indoor and outdoor pools. And in August, dude, this is like a lot. This is fucking ancient. In August of 2020, one of the indoor pools commenced its use of the innovative AI monitoring system developed by an Israeli startup. Consisting of four ceiling-mounted cameras overlooking the 25 by 15 meter pool, this system aims to enhance safety through advanced technology. Thomas Baum, the operator, uh, the operations manager at Matiaqua, uh, the regional pool operator, explains that the cameras detect water movements and record movement profiles for analysis using AI algorithms. When the system identifies irregular patterns, so like this. <laughs> that actually must be really challenging at like a kids pool. Yeah, because kids pools because kids are crazy. always just irregularly doing. They've patterns. got no, they've got no discernible pattern. <laughs> um, it promptly alerts the pool staff via their smartwatches. So like the staff are just like hanging out eating fucking bur- like when you go to the pool. I've actually been watching this when when I, I go to the hot tub every day before we go to the gym. You just stare at the lifeguard. I do. I stare, but I stare at both of them because I'm I'm actually fascinated by their job simultaneously. Um, yeah, and they're and so I my eyes go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll look at them like do their job, and and they 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 almost every single time I'm down there, 
they they cycle up. There's always two lifeguards, and one's like sitting at the desk, like whatever, doing fucking like their high school homework or whatever, and the other one's watching the people swim. And then when they go to switch out, right, because there is a desk there. When they go to switch out, the 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 lifeguard who isn't in the tower. Um, who's doing the swap, like who's going to swap in, they stand next to the tower and they keep an eye on the water. And then the person in the tower gets down and the person in the tower then stands in their place, watches the water while the other person goes up. So there's always eyes on pool. They do like a hand sign too, like to be like, just gesture to switch. Yeah, totally right. Um, so, so they're always, always looking wow. at the water. There's never eyes not on the pool, which I'm like, that's a that's a good system. To They're have kind in place. of like um like you know those soldiers that stand like on guard in front of like a, a parliamentary Hill. building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're kind of like yeah, that. Now this I feel like this AI system. Do you ever do you ever try to do you ever go up to them and try to get distract them? Oh, uh, every time from watching the pool. I'm in the hot tub and I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like this AI thing is kind of like incentivizing lifeguards to be like. Cool, dude. Hey, has got it. I'll fucking, I'll, it'll tell me. Well, that get, that kind of is what it is, right? I mean, I guess. I don't know. When the system identifies irregular patterns, it promptly alerts pool staff via their smartwatches. Uh, sh- I mean, it's sort of like Shahabuddin the same. Shahabuddin Kabati. Kabtibi. Shahabuddin it's, Kabati. It's, it's, it's kind of just the same thing as like, as you know, the, the eventual proliferation of self-driving cars where it's like, mm. once we are supremely confident, which I'm pretty sure that stat is already true, that self-driving cars cause less accidents than human drivers. I'm pretty sure that is true and has been true actually for some time now. Um, and, may, and I mean, maybe, maybe in the future, this will, this will end up looking like, you know, like a there's game. a regular pattern. And then like yeah. one of the fucking claws yeah. yes. from the video, from the arcade yes. game just picks exactly. a person up and, and puts them in a but ball th- pit. there has to be a major innovation on the claws because yeah. the claws, almost every time you, they drop it. Yeah, yeah but that's yeah, rigged. To... Those machines are rigged. They certainly have the technology yeah. to be able to efficiently claw grab. Okay, so they're just taking my pool. money. So yeah, this uh, uh, this uh, Katibi person, a pool attendant involved yeah. since the system's inception, describes how the smartwatches emit an audible beep, vibrate, and display a red dot indicating the precise location of the person in distress. Additionally, three accompanying pictures provide further context to aid the response initially there were instances of false alarms triggered by routine swimmer movements such as roll turns however as time passed the ai system adapted and learned to distinguish between normal swimming actions and genuine emergencies <laughs> i'm just it's really, it's really funny like how easy would it be to just trick that ai like if you like if you were just a shit kid being like i'm gonna make the eye think fucking three people are drowning here. just like yeah, you you're, know, right. you're right. You're like right. But AI I mean, the tactic. thing about AI—the thing about an AI system—is that the more data it analyzes, the the better it becomes at understanding what is and what isn't. Yeah. Totally. It, it probably at some point it's like even tracking like you know oxygen that's being released in the area to tell if you're even breathing or not. Totally. Like, you know, like yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if like that system. I mean, I'm sure it probably sucks initially, but once it's like all trained up, I mean, it's it is it is very much so like the like a self-driving car where they just like they they roll it out in this like very limited capacity Mm. in these places where they're like okay you can only do this in arizona which by the way is because arizona has i I learned um which is the same reason why all u-haul trucks have arizona license plates because arizona has the most lax traffic uh traffic (laughs) laws um in north america oh interesting (laughs) yeah so that's why all the all the self-driving oh i knew this yeah right they have a big uh, thing they have a thing like in like phoenix and um and uh, what's the other one? What's the other big city in Tucson, Arizona? N- Tucson is also big, but it's in Scottsdale. Uh, they got a big thing every uh, every August where it's the it's the 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 fucking blindfolded race day of <laughs> in Tucson where like everyone Blind, everyone blindfolds blindfold themselves and, yeah yeah and they just drive yeah and, and you circuit. can. Within the laws. Yeah. It's, in the, it's within the so laws. So the cost of implementation on this uh, program depends on the pool size and the number of cameras acquired, uh, with the estimated annual expenditure ranging from thirty-two grand to forty-two grand for the current pool. Uh, the AI lifeguard system is not intended to replace human staff or water rescue services by implementing a giant claw. Instead, <laughs> it acts as an additional layer of protection for both staff members and swimmers. Thomas Baum emphasizes the system's significance. If it works only once in 10 years and saves a person's life, 
then every cent invested was worth it. If it does not save anyone's life, I have made a massive, massive, massive mistake. <laughs> Maybe like thirty-two to forty-two thousand dollars over ten years. So I don't know, three hundred twenty to four hundred twenty thousand dollars for a human life. Pretty, uh, That's what it costs every year. Pretty, it oh, says okay. with the estimated annual expenditure ranging from thirty-two to forty-two thousand. Oh. Per year, yeah. What, what's what's the fucking upkeep on a couple cameras and an AI system? Servers, <sighs> dude. I mean, again, this is the going back again to self driving. It's like if you prove over time that with this, there's like less incidence of whatever, whatever the measurement is, death or like serious Ooh. health risk. Oh, you know, then there is when you have humans watching it. Then eventually, Ooh. it will be the thing. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think this is? <laughs> Uh, elephant bear? seal. That is the sound of a crocodile. Oh wow! Isn't that crazy? That would have made that made a lot of sense. Basically, have you guys ever seen that's crocodile. A crocodile? That is what I sound like after a Donair pizza from Domino's. <laughs> have you guys <laughs> ever too. seen a crocodile up up close? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, they're fucking. I mean, speaking of Jurassic Park, get, speaking of dinosaurs, yeah, they are dinosaurs. I mean, I I've saw, seen an alligator up close. We saw this. Um, I was in. Well, uh, actually, I don't know what I saw. <laughs> if, I, well, if, it was if, one or the other. I mean, allig- are they really that much different? How different is an alligator uh, and a croc? An alligator is is uh, typically um, like more slender. Crocodile is smaller. Beefier. A crocodile is like a proper fucking actually, dinosaur. I've seen one in the Nile. Um, you saw one in the Nile. Yeah. Um, there was That's a bridge. Uh, scary. We went to uh, Co- Costa Rica, and. Uh, this was like 10 years ago. And we went, uh, we stopped like midway from where we went from the airport to where we were going on the coast. We stopped at this like stand and the stand was like right in front of this bridge. And the bridge was over this sort of like, kind of like half dried up little river. Um, or I guess it was extreme. It was probably like, like 80 feet wide or something. And it was just a common place for these crocodiles to be. So it was like, oh, you put the stand there. We'll stop. We'll get a. We'll get a, a a fruit juice or something, and like look at all these fucking crocodiles. It's crazy. Like parasite. And so we 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 stopped to look at them, and then a week later, uh, our friend Carolina was also there, and somebody fell off the bridge, <gasps> and someone and the crocodile. Like we're talking, we're Stop. talking, we're talking like twenty plus gigantic crocodiles. Like swarming and and like feeding and drinking and all that stuff, fucking ate the person. Oh my god! No. Yeah. Dead? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. This would have been me. Oh, but that uh, that didn't work. <laughs> um, <laughs> this would have been me. How nuts is that? That's me. That's me panicking watching. I didn't even think about it. You know it's. You know, it's Dude, like, that would suck. It's funny about living in in Canada, where there's like not a lot of like wildlife that could kill you. There um, is though, not not as much. Ah, as fuck, like, dude, other a moose places. will kill you. A fucking bear will kill yes, you. Yes, but like yeah. you can. But they're so big. A you rabid see them coming, dog you know? will kill you. And they, like, and they tend to be beavers. Further, they tend to be further away from beavers. Us. Will kill you. But, but, they'll, but, eat but your, they'll eat your asshole but, first. But the, it's funny because when I was in Costa Rica, um, I was driving you. a rental car down the coast and. Like when I put the destination that we wanted to go to into the GPS, it was like, go back inland and take this like highway and drive there. Um, but I wanted to like take the scenic route. And so we saw this like little road along the coast and I was like, I can probably drive that. So we took this road and like slowly during the course of like the eight hour drive, it turned into like a like a four wheeler. Oh, you're, always, you're always rolling it the was, dice of roads. In, it in was Central so America. Like there were massive boulders and like we were like at one point it felt like we were driving down a footpath and then we got to this river and the river was like 50 meters wide and 50 meters. Yeah, it was super wide and um, there was no road on the other side so I, or I couldn't see it. Like I and, and I was at this point I was like, I now have to drive three hours back no. the other way. So I got Maddie to walk down around the corner and and like the river kind of took this bend. And when she went around the corner, she was like, I, I can see the road on the other side. There's like, it kind of like shifted down and went in. And we're in this, like this, uh, Hyundai Tucson. 
uh, rental car. Big city, big and, city uh, in uh, Arizona. And uh, <laughs> and I'm like, fuck it. At this point, I'm like, I'm just gonna drive through. So I, I got her to like walk out into the river to see how deep it was, and it was like, and this is a rental car. Yeah, and it was like it was like <laughs> thigh deep, and I didn't even think that there could be like crocodiles in the river because you're be. just thinking about like what it would be. I mean, I like I, if it was a I river guess. here. Anyway, I was just like, fuck it. And I same, drove same. through the river. The water came over the windshield. Oh, my and, God, dude. Oh, it was it was I th- I was like, this car might get stuck in the middle of the water. Anyway, just like kind of plowed. And through. halfway through, he went, I decline insurance. It, uh, well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and dude, when I got back, we took the car to a, a car wash and like sprayed the undercarriage because it was so fucked. Was it fucked inside? Did it any was, water get in? No water got inside. Did crocodiles get in? <laughs> crocodiles <laughs> in the back seat when we finished when we got across the river. Anyway, it was so it was so bad. It was really scary. But we got back and just dropped the car at the airport and left. You no, know it sounds well, like it sounds like it, it sounds like the built, fucking so. T Rex that's hanging over the car and dressed apart. Yeah, it does. Well, here, listen to this. Here's a little uh, here's a little uh, crocodile fucking insider news for you right now. Virgin birth recorded in crocodile for first time ever. The the crocodile Jesus Christ <laughs> yeah. has been born. Messiah. Didn't, wasn't there another virgin birth of something like recently? Did we talk yeah, about that? Dude, fucking. What did we talk about? Kyla, Zaya. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Because Kyle and I never had. Kyle, you and Kyle never uh, boned. <laughs> um, <laughs> technically. Uh, scientists have announced right, the first right. ever recorded case of a crocodile virgin birth after a female that had been isolated for 16 years was discovered with a clutch of eggs. The discovery oh. provides tantalizing insights. Oh, this was it. This is the thing the I was thinking about. Evolutionary I saw origins of the tra- of the trait, potentially shedding light on the reproductive capabilities of dinosaurs, and right, it was Jesus like a, it was a, savior. It was like a croc savior. that was like in isolation at a zoo or something, and then they showed up one day and they were like, "What the fuck? Who fucked this yeah. thing?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, the American crocodile, Crocodilus acutus was taken into captivity in 2002 when she was two years old and placed in an enclosure at Park Reptiliandia in Costa Rica. She remained alone for the next 16 years. How sad. But in January 2018, a clutch of 14 eggs was found in the enclosure. Virgin births, also known as faculative parthenogenesis, FP, is a type of asexual reproduction in species that would normally reproduce sexually. Scientists have documented it, it in birds, sharks, lizards, and snakes in captivity. Wow. How fucking crazy is that? That is insane. Among other species. Until now, it had never been recorded among crocodilia. The <laughs> order that includes crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and garales. What the fuck is a garale? G H A. R I A L S, a garel. Garel. Some type of lizard. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Yo, nobody wants to see one of these motherfuckers. A garel is uh, one of those guys that have oh, like, the, they're like the fucking long beat oh. boys. Yeah, it looks like a kind of like an alligator. Long Dude. beat boys. Long beat boys. Ew. Turbo, you're, not on the tur- you're not part of the turbo team. Uh, in a study published on Wednesday, June 7th, in the journal Biology Letters, Researchers said seven of the 14 eggs produced by the crocodile in Costa Rica were viable. Zoo caretakers incubated these eggs, but they didn't hatch. So after three months, they opened the eggs. The contents of six of the eggs was confetti. (laughs) Is this real? (laughs) And then they said was not discernible. But one contained a fully formed but non-viable fetus. Genetic analysis showed it was almost identical to the mother. Wow. The team, led by Warren Booth, an entomologist at Virginia Tech, wrote in the study that it was disappointing that the egg failed to hatch, but that it is not unusual for offspring born this way to suffer abnormalities and fail to thrive. Interesting. FP, again, um, faculative parthenogenesis, they added, may be more common in species on the brink of extinction. Whoa. And studies investigating wild populations can reveal more cases. It reminds me of the, like when wow. we were talking about um, the embryos made from stem cells. And like if it was only one person's DNA, right, like right. Would, what would, would it be less likely to be a viable yeah. embryo? Yeah. They also said the discovery of a virgin birth in a crocodile means FP has now been found in both um, birds, which descended from dinosaurs, and crocodilian, suggesting a common evolutionary origin. Birds and crocodilians 
are the remaining representatives of Archeo- archosaurs, the group that also included dinosaurs and um, pterosaurs. This new evidence offers tantalizing <laughs> insights into the possible reproductive capabilities of extinct Archosian, archosaurian relatives of crocodilians, notably the pterosauria and the dinosauria, they wrote. How about that? You know what's interesting is that, um, I, I mean, especially around the fact that it wasn't, um, that the eggs weren't viable and they said that they're typically not viable is that in the one example that we have of this in humans, like the, he went on to be like kind of like the model figure for like humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Messiah. Yeah. Jesus, pretty, Jesus Christ. Pretty I wonder wild. how much, I wonder how much uh virgin vir- birth, like he went on to be kind of like the model, the model guy. Do you think virgin, do you think the Virgin Mary had like pterosaurus blood in her or something? How the fuck did that either that or she was lonely because like maybe she was in isolation. She was feeling like she was going to go extinct. That could have been one of the things that happened during COVID with people isolating is if they were like sort of single getting pregnant people with vaginas that all of a sudden they just started like getting pregnant. Are there any uh, pop pop their belly just popped out outside of Virgin Mary? Any records of human? No virgin. A lot of people say outside of Virgin Mary. Probably a lot of people. Uh, there it. is. Well, really? Wow. Hold on. Hold on. Let's just let's not get ahead of ourselves here. You're making faces. That is the jury in or is the jury out on <laughs> I this? I think the jury is very much. The out. jury's the jury. I don't know where the jury is. I think the jury's in on. I this. think the jury's. Yeah, actually, I think the jury's pretty in. But let's say <laughs> let's say they've sat down, but they haven't read the verdict yet. There is one documented case of a natural half parthenogenic sorry, parthenogenetic birth. In 1995, Nature Genetics reported a child that had some cells, about 50%, that consisted of genetic material only from his mother and some that were normal and consisted of DNA from both parents. Doctors who studied the child theorized that one of the mother's eggs had, that had been fertilized by the father fused with an unfertilized egg that was dividing parth, uh, parthenogenically. Might Jesus have been a biological one in a billion like that kid? Not according to Christian belief, which holds that the virgin birth of Jesus was not parthenogenesis, but strictly miraculous and not explainable by science as a natural process. I mean, yeah, of course. That's that's how that... That's, that's how, how that, miracles work. <coughs> that's how miracles work. And that's why they um, write books about you that just go on. So I guess and <laughs> that is the magic of miracles. <laughs> And that is all we have for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, folks. And if you want to support the podcast, leave us a rating, leave us a review, press a rate on Spotify. Anywhere it says rate, just rate it and rate it good. I mean, that's, a, that's all you need to do. We just want good ratings. Uh, and uh, if you want to come join the Discord, we're having lots of uh, interesting conversations happening over there, episode discussions. You can help produce the podcast. Uh, who knows? So uh, check out the Discord link in the show notes of this episode. And if you want to be a guest on our show, talking to super interesting people all the time, if you feel like that's your jam out there, sickpointpodcast.com. Head there, fill out the form. And uh, for those who are watching on YouTube, uh, thanks. You can always leave a comment and let us know that you're watching below. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, there will be no episode on YouTube next week. There will be a Feel Good Friday as usual, though, on all your favorite podcast platforms. Um, But a huge thank you as well to the folks who make the show happen thank you jeff lonis uh and thank you to richard coin for the theme music we definitely want to make sure brian doesn't get eaten by a polar bear yeah up at the north pole yeah that is it for this week i'm brian i'm taylor and i'm jeremy and this is sick boy Whoa!